I've mentioned free body diagrams in the lecture and you guys have seen a lot of pictures of objects drawn with arrows pointing out from them. Those pictures aren't truly free body diagrams as you'll see in just a minute, but they're related to free body diagrams. And being able to draw good free body diagrams is really going to help you organize your thoughts and organize your problem solving as we move into a lot of these Newton's Law problems. So we're going to have a whole little session here on how to draw free body diagrams. The first thing you need to know is that when we draw a free body diagram, we represent whatever object we're drawing as a dot. It doesn't matter if that's a boat, a car, a mountain, an airplane, a person, a television, a kite, whatever. It gets represented as a dot because all of the forces and the type of motion we're talking about now, all of the forces act like they're being applied right to sort of the center of mass or the middle of that body. The center mass isn't technically the middle, but it'll be a good enough explanation for now. So no matter where that force is applied, we just draw it coming off of a dot and we represent everybody as a dot. So we make our dot and then we draw every force that's acting on the body. So in this case, we have some object with a single force acting downwards. It doesn't matter if this force acts on this side of the body, we still draw it just pointing down. All the arrows point away from the dot in the direction that the force is acting. We also use the length of the arrows to indicate how big the force is or the magnitude of the force. So in my picture here on the left, we have a body that is subject to two forces. So there are two forces acting on this body. One is acting upwards and one is acting downwards and those arrows are the same length, so I'm indicating that those forces have the same magnitude, so this body would not be accelerating. It might be moving, but it wouldn't be accelerating because the sum of this upward force and this downward force would be zero because they have the same magnitude, but point in opposite directions. In this second free body diagram, I have a much bigger upwards force than I do downwards force. So this object would be accelerating upwards. Sometimes I don't know the exact magnitude of the forces that I'm drawing, and I just use these free body diagrams to represent the relative magnitude. If I know this object is accelerating upwards, I wanna make sure I draw that upwards arrow bigger to indicate that, even if I don't know how much bigger it is. And similarly, for this last diagram, if I knew my body this body was accelerating downwards, I would want to make sure that the arrow that points down that indicates the force in the downward direction was bigger because that's how I would know it would be accelerating downwards. So we label each force then with the information we know about that force. For example, if for each of these objects here, I know that the force of gravity acting on that object has a magnitude of 10 newtons. I would draw Fg equals 10 newtons, or I would add that label to each of these arrows pointing down. If I knew that the upward force was a normal force, so these were all objects sitting on some surface like the table or the ground, um, or even just in my hand, maybe, label all of those the normal force and if I knew the magnitude I could label that but if I don't I'm just going to label them by the type of force that they are. In a free body diagram you only include forces that are acting on the object not forces that are exerted by the object. So if my circle here represents the playground bully who is pushing someone else on the playground I'm not going to put the push that A gives to B on A's free body diagram. That's a force exerted by A on another object. So that doesn't get included in A's free body diagram. You'll learn in a little bit that B is then also pushing on A and that force exerted by B on A would go on A's free body diagram but a force exerted by A does not go on the free body diagram. We'll see hopefully some examples of this later on. Sometimes we break vectors into their x and y components, but we never include a vector and its components on a free body diagram. 
If we did that, it would be like doubling that force. So here we have a child that's picking an apple. Um, apparently this child's actually just pretending to pick an apple, but she's pulling on the apple. And what other forces would there be? So there's my apple, and I'm going to draw a free body diagram of the apple, not of the child. So just this apple. So we know the child is pulling like this. So we'll add that force to the free body diagram. We could also add gravity and the force from the tree if we wanted to. If we break that force down, the force applied by the child, we get an X component and a Y component. We then get rid of that diagonal force because if I kept it there, I would be doubly representing that force. So if you break it down into its X and Y components, you get rid of the original vector. Again, I could add the force of gravity here, acting downwards on that apple. Typically this is drawn a little bit closer or sometimes these arrows will overlap, but for clarity I put it next to it so you could see that there are two forces acting down now. And then the force from the tree, which has got to have an upward component and a component to the left to balance these forces to some extent. This apple's probably accelerating if the child is doing an okay job of picking an apple, and so we wouldn't expect the sum of these forces to be zero, but we do think that the tree is likely pulling sort of in this direction if we look at its structure. We also know that the free body diagram only shows forces directly acting on the object. So here I have a physics textbook that's sitting on top of a column. If we want to draw a free body diagram of that textbook, it would look something like this. So there's our dot to represent the textbook. We know that the force of gravity is pulling down on that textbook, and there's a normal force from the column pushing up. What if I add another textbook on top? Now I want to draw the free body diagram of that top textbook. It looks just the same. I have the force of gravity acting downwards on that textbook, and the normal force acting upwards. This normal force comes from the lower textbook. There's not a force from the column on the top textbook because the column and that top textbook aren't directly interacting. We know that if we took the column away, both textbooks would fall. But the force from the column is sort of transmitted through this textbook and is not directly acting on the top textbook. So we just have the normal force from the white textbook and the force of gravity is the two forces acting on this green textbook. If I was to draw the free body diagram now for the bottom textbook, I would have the normal force from the column, the force of gravity on the textbook, and a force pushing downwards from the green textbook. If you look, we know that this textbook is not accelerating, so we know that the sum of these two vectors plus this vector, so these two would have a negative magnitude, these would have a positive magnitude, has got to equal to zero, which is why my vector pointing upwards, the normal force from the column is so much longer. Okay, this is a lot of rules, but we're going to step through them quickly. There's a couple particular types of forces that we're going to learn more about as we go along, but these are just clues for drawing free body diagrams. You do not need to memorize all of these right now, but you may want to use some of them as you work through the interactive assignment. So friction is always in the opposite direction of the motion or the potential motion between two surfaces. So if I am trying to drag a heavy box across the rug, friction acts in the opposite direction of my pull. Friction acts in that opposite direction whether or not the box is moving. Tension forces 
which are the forces of something pulling on a rope or a chain or a cable, always act in line with that rope, cable, etc. Gravity is always down. The normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. Students sometimes get confused and they want the normal force to always be up. That's not the case. The normal force is always perpendicular to the surface. Drag or air resistance is always opposite the direction of motion. So if an object is flying through the air moving to the right, the force of drag or air resistance would act to the left. Finally, if an object is not accelerating in a direction, the sum of the forces in that direction must be zero. When we say in a direction, what we usually mean is if an object is maybe accelerating in Y, but is not accelerating horizontally, so it's accelerating vertically, but not horizontally, the sum of the forces in X, that horizontal dimension, has to be zero, even though the sum of the forces in Y is not zero. All right, now you get a little bit of a chance to practice. These are my dogs. We're going to draw a free body diagram of either dog. You can take your pick. This is Suki. This is Rover. And in these pictures, they are both sitting or lying on either the floor or on their bed. So we have a dog at rest. And you want to choose which of these free body diagrams could represent that dog at rest and not accelerating. So we know number two is the answer. The normal force is the force from either the bed or the floor pushing upwards on the dog and the force of gravity is always acting on the dog. We see that these two arrows have the same length because they have the same magnitude. We know they have the same magnitude because the dog is at rest. The dog is not accelerating at all. What about this? So here's my coffee cup. I actually show holding it two different ways. One with my hand underneath and one sort of holding it by the handle. And I'm picking up my coffee cup so that the coffee cup is accelerating vertically. It's just accelerating vertically, not horizontally. The first question is, does it matter how I'm holding the cup if the acceleration is the same? And it really doesn't. In both cases, I must be exerting a vertical force so that it accelerates vertically. So given that, which of these free body diagrams could represent the motion of my cup or represent the forces acting on my cup? Correct, the answer is number three. Whatever force I'm applying has to be bigger than the force of gravity. We also said that, or we know there can't be any horizontal component to the force, like as shown in one or four, because my cup isn't accelerating horizontally. We said it's only accelerating vertically, which means I must have a net zero force in the horizontal direction. In one, I have a force applied just to the right, so that can't equal to zero in horizontal. In four, I also have a component of my applied force going to the right, and so I can't have zero horizontal acceleration. Number two, I have zero horizontal acceleration, or zero horizontal net force, so that's correct, but my force applied is equal to my force of gravity, so my cup would not be accelerating upwards in number two. All of this makes number three the correct answer. One last image. So I am pushing horizontally into this book, which is then pushed into the wall. So I push on the book, the wall pushes on the book, and something is holding this book up. We want to figure out which of these could be a free body diagram of the book. So 
So number four. So number four has the force of gravity, which we know we need because we are on Earth. So gravity is acting on this book no matter what. So all four of our diagrams have that. One issue with one, two, and three is that it shows the normal force going upwards. In this case, we're talking about a normal force from the wall. And that normal force can't be up because the normal force has to be perpendicular to the wall. That means that the normal force has to be outwards, like this. I push in, the normal force from the wall pushes back out, and we actually have the force of friction keeping that book 